Before I begin to speak about the CNA subject, the three seminars which we will be doing. The first seminar which we'll be doing tomorrow evening is about emotional freedom techniques. How many of you know this technique? Raise your hand. Okay. Very few. Those of you that already know it, if you need the feel the need to brush up on yourselves, that is to remember how to do it well, you may come and it's the half of the offering. You can offer half of the amount. This technique is a revolution in psychology. It's called energy psychology. It's a technique which very surprisingly brings about dramatic positive results simply by tapping on certain acupuncture points while we are focused on the specific emotional energy field which is upsetting us, such as fear, anger, pain, disappointment, depression, and it can even be used for physical problems, such as headaches, stomach aches, uh, women, the pain during the time of the period, uh, sores, and these kinds of things. It can also be used for addictions to chocolate, to sugar, to cigarettes, to substances from which we would like to get free from. Okay? And it can also be used to change the state of our energy. That is, when we are tired, or when we are nervous or anxious, simply by tapping on these few very specific points, we can change the state of our energy. Now, on the sheets that you have, you have been given a sheet which on both sides speaks about the effect of EFT on pain and other case histories. These are downloaded from uh, the site www.emofree.com and also our site holisticharmony.com. You will find here an emphasis on physical problems. On the other side of the page you will see some cases of fears and phobias. The main effect of the technique is on the emotions. To the degree that our physical problems are the result of emotional upset, that is the fact that the emotions are upsetting the energy field, and this disturbed energy field is creating a physical problem, which could be ulcers or colitis or even cancer or headaches, whatever it may be. To the degree that the problem is a result of emotions, it can be reversed, and people can have wonderful results. I've been working for 35 years now solely on studying methods of human harmony, employing them on myself and then teaching them to others and seeking to support others in that process of healing themselves or freeing, the, freeing themselves from any obstacles to health, to happiness, to harmony, to better relationships, to more productivity. I have found many techniques which have been very useful, but this one is the simplest and most effective. So any of you that want to learn this technique, you can come uh, tomorrow. Also, you can learn it through this video, which is a four-hour explanation. It's, it's four hours taken from the 12-hour seminar that I did the last time I was here in Beirut. This was recorded here in Beirut last time with subtitles, which enables you to learn the technique quite completely. And also, uh, there is a book on the subject which gives a lot of details on how to apply it in specific situations for self-esteem, for relationship problems, for health problems, 
uh, for fear. So these are useful for employing this technique. That we will be teaching tomorrow from 7 until 10 here in this room. The second seminar, which will be on Saturday, will be how to create harmonious relationships. And I'm going to talk about that in more detail this evening and explain to you some of what we're going to do. And then on the third day, uh, it will be a time for meditation, inner work, self-observation, in which we will alternate between meditation, relaxation, various forms of expression, and all the time observing our minds and observing how our minds function and becoming the witness of our mental functionings as a first step towards becoming free from those mental functionings. Now knowing EFT, this emotional freedom techniques, will be useful both on Saturday and on Sunday. For those of you that have not learned it well, I will try to do a small introduction during those seminars. But it would be much better for you, you would have greater results if you, are, you know how to perform this technique because it is the single most effective technique that I have seen for overcoming the obstacles to meditation and the obstacles to the transcendence of the mind and also all of the obstacles which appear in our relationships. Now Saturday we'll be working from 10 until 7 with a one hour break at lunchtime. And on Sunday from 10 to 2, working on meditation. So with that introduction, let me explain to you more what we'll be working on in far, as far as relationships go. As far as the emotional freedom techniques go, our goal is to be able, on the one hand, to become free from all negative emotions. That is, to be able to free myself from being so dependent on the other person's behavior so that the other person's attitude or behavior affects my inner reality. That is to find enough inner security, self-worth, and self-confidence so that I can be myself in the relationships that I am. The second aspect is to be able to free ourselves from all fear of communicating openly. So on the one hand, I want to be able to free myself from the anger and the fear and the resentment and the negativity that I have, which accumulates in me because the other person is not behaving as I would like them to behave. Another aspect is understanding my needs and being able to express those needs clearly. Now clearly means without criticism, without accusation, without shouting, but it also means expressing them and being totally clear and assertive as to how we feel and what we need in the relationship. Now we have given you a sheet here which on one side has, has, says remove pain and be free to be happy with energy psychology. There you will see a list of the chapters in the book that I mentioned earlier. And on the right hand side, possible uses of EFT, emotional freedom techniques. And you can look through that this evening and decide if you're interested in doing the seminar tomorrow. But on the back part of that page, it says, how can we create and maintain a fulfilling, loving, and growing relationship? Now, 90% of what we will be saying and doing applies to all relationships. Relationships with the spouse, with the children, with the parents, with the brothers and sisters, with our co-workers. About 10% of what we will be discussing 
has to do specifically with our love partner, whether we're married or not, but with the person with which we have a love relationship. Let's look at some of the guidelines here as to what we can do. These are from the book Relationships of Conscious Love. It's this book here, uh, which uh, is available there. Some of the aspects that you'll find in that book. First of all, before we create a relationship, and this has to do more with a love partner and not with parents or children, it's important to clarify our life values. We can love many people, but we can't live our lives with many people. Love is actually a universal energy which ultimately as we grow spiritually, we should be able to feel towards just about every human being. But whether we have the same goals, want the same lifestyles, that is another factor. I may love someone deeply, but not be able to live with them, not be able to share the same house with them or family with them. So it's very important for those who are about to enter into a relationship, first of all, to clarify what they want from life and ask the other person to clarify what they want from life because the feeling of eratus, as it's called in Greek, being in love with somebody, being infatuated with someone, doesn't usually last more than a few years. And then you start to see the negative aspects of the other person, the aspects which begin to bother you. And now you have a choice. Either you leave or you live a life of compromise, not being happy in a dead relationship, or you manage to transform that infatuation into pure love. And you keep a relationship of pure love with that person. It's not easy. Most people don't manage that. In the West, most people just separate. In the East, most people just compromise. I don't think that we were born to do that. I think we were born to live in love and to be able to find ways to regenerate those feelings of love towards a person, even though that person has certain traits which bother us. And this is exactly where EFT will be very effective in allowing us not to be so annoyed by the other's behavior. Because 90% of our negative feelings do not have to do with the other person, actually, but with ourselves. And have a lot to do with our childhood. Most often, when I am working with a person who is having difficulties in their relationship, we we'll be working on the problem with the partner for about 10 minutes, and then we find ourselves working on the relationship with one of the parents. Because this is just a reenactment. It's a replay of most of the things we have experienced as children. Okay, so the first aspect is to prepare ourselves. And one aspect of preparing ourselves besides uh, clarifying our values is creating a sense of inner security. It's my belief that for a couple to live together harmoniously, they have to be able to live separately. That is, one must be complete in oneself in order to be in a healthy relationship. If I am dependent on the other and cannot feel secure or worthy or fulfilled or happy without, without the other, then I am in a dependent relationship. And my dependency is going to cause me to feel resentful and angry, especially when I make compromises out of my fear of losing the other person. It's going to prevent me from being myself. I will have to alter who I am from my fear of being alone. 
it's better for a relationship to be based on choice than on fear. And I choose to be with that person not because I cannot be happy without that person, but because I love that person and I enjoy that person and I respect that person and we give each other joy. Not because I am fearful to be alone. The second important aspect of creating a healthy relationship, and now this applies to all relationships, to parents and children, brothers and sisters, co-workers, and of course in love relationships, is to take responsibility for my reality. Most relationships are destroyed by the fact that the one believes that the other is the cause of his reality. Now this has two aspects. One aspect is that I feel angry at you because you are not giving me what I need to be happy. And so I keep accumulating resentment. And at some point this resentment comes out as a burst of anger. And you don't know really why I'm so angry. Because I am not really always expressing my needs and I'm holding this in. So one is the accumulation of anger and resentment and the feelings of injustice because I believe that you are responsible for me being not happy. The other part of this coin is that I feel responsible for your reality. And so that I feel guilty, unhappy, when you are not satisfied with me, or when you are not happy, or healthy, or successful. Now often we feel this for the love partner, we feel responsible, but almost always we feel this for our children. And we feel also for our parents. that. I cannot be happy and I am not a worthy mother or father or spouse or child if my parent or child or sibling is not happy. Now please be clear, I am not advocating not caring about the other person. I believe very much that we should care and we should do as much as we possibly can to help our loved ones be happy and make sacrifices of love, out of love. Sacrifices that we make out of fear don't say anything. If I keep sacrificing myself and my time because I am afraid of being rejected or I will feel guilty, that has no worth. But sacrificing my needs and my time because I love the other person and care for the other person, that has great worth. So it's important to know why we sacrifice when we do sacrifice. But as much as I sacrifice myself and my time and my energy, it's impossible for me to create the other person's happiness or health or success. And what happens? When, I, when they are not the way I need them to be, in order to me to feel successful in the role of the responsible one for that person, I feel failure. I feel I'm not worthy as a human being because I have failed to create their happiness or their success or their health, and then I get angry at them. And then they feel suppressed because I'm trying to put them in a certain box so that they will become healthy or happy because I need them to be that way in order to me, for me to feel my self-worth, and I say that this is love, and it is love to a certain extent, but it's also my need for self-worth in the role that I have taken on as the responsible one for this person. Now this is a very difficult problem to overcome because our whole society is set up to misunderstand attachment with love. And uh, 
we would be considered insensitive, uncaring, if a, a loved one had problems and we were not falling apart. You see, the whole society demands of us uh, to take responsibility emotionally for the others. But this does not create healthy relationships. This, this creates relationships of codependence in which one is dependent on the other and the other is dependent upon the others being dependent on him. The strong is as dependent as the weak because the strong one needs to have a weak one to take care of. And he's playing the parent or he's playing the teacher or he's playing the savior in this case, okay? So in order to have healthy relationships with our children, with our parents, with our loved ones, we need to create relationships of co-commitment, not co-dependency. And we will work on the, the big difference between co-commitment and co-dependency on Saturday. We will discover where we are being dependent and how we can transform that into a commitment without dependency. The third aspect of creating a harmonious relationship is more effective communication. Most of us have not learned to communicate effectively. And it's a shame. It's a simple process and it could be taught in all schools. In <laughs> fact, it, children know how to communicate effectively. They say exactly the truth until they learn that it's dangerous to tell the truth. And then they start learning to tell lies. And then they start learning to cover the truth. If we could just stay with that simplicity of a child that says, I'm hungry, I'm angry, I'm hurt, I love you, simple words which describe basic human states which we try to camouflage and because we can't show our fear we show our anger and because we can't say I love you it's never heard because we're afraid of what that may mean and how the other person may take it so effective communication is a process in which we learn to to communicate to the other person exactly what we are feeling, exactly what we need, and what we believe. Feelings, needs, and beliefs, as they are. So many times people come up to me and they say, look, my boyfriend this, and this is how I'm feeling, so how can I tell him this without uh, him knowing this and this and this. All these plans, these war plans about the relationship. He says, why don't you just say the truth? Why don't you just say what you're feeling and what you need? We have become so complicated. We're so afraid of people seeing our fears, people seeing our needs, people getting the upper hand or using what we say in a future conversation, that we have lost the simplicity and the honesty of communication. So the first step is to be able to express what I need without accusing in what is called an I message. A you message is when I say, you're a bum, you're worthless, you're insensitive, you're a donkey. An I message is, you know, I am feeling hurt and I need more attention from you. I need you to pay attention to me when I'm speaking to you. I need to spend more time together. I need more affection. Rather than calling the other person all these names, just say what you need. But it's not only that we have the difficulty to express our needs, we have the difficulty of expressing gratitude, love, admiration, because maybe the other person will get the upper hand and we're in an antagonistic role competition with the other person and we don't want them to know that we admire certain characteristics that they have. 
So we need to overcome this fear of expressing the positive also. But effective listening has also the opposite, which is called active listening, learning how to listen. How to listen effectively so that we enable the other person to externalize what is really going on in themselves. When someone says something to us, our usual reaction is a rebuttal, a counter accusation, or advice. We seldom ask more questions to see what is really going on in that person, what they really need, what they really feel. This is a very important method to learn, especially with children, because it brings forth from the children the knowledge that is within them. Actually, the Greek philosopher Socrates used this method. It's called meftiki. It has to do with giving birth, actually. It's, it means giving birth to the knowledge which is in a, in a person. Our children and our loved ones have the knowledge within them as souls as to what they need to do in the next step in their lives. When we tell them what to do, we destroy that inner voice. Okay, so another important aspect of communication is active listening. A fourth very important aspect of relationships is being able to put ourselves in the other's position. What happens is that when someone behaves towards us in a way which is annoying, we become so focused on what we are feeling and so focused on how we are going to protect ourselves or get what we want in this case, that we completely forget what might be happening in the other person. If we would just stop for five minutes and say, look, I'm just going to imagine that I am this person. I am my child. I am my parent. I am my spouse or my sibling. In order for me to act in the way that they are acting, what must I feel? Because the general law is that behind every negative human behavior, there is fear. It may come out as anger, it may come out as aggression, but I give you a written verification there is fear behind that, that aggressivity or that behavior, or selfishness, or even laziness, or whatever it is. So if I can put myself in the other's position, I will be in a much better position to communicate, understand that this person at this point is upset, Something that we say in our seminars is, when the other person is shouting and accusing and threatening, whatever they say, whatever they do, you just hear one thing. You just hear them saying, look how unhappy I am. That person is unhappy. Otherwise, he wouldn't be shouting, wouldn't be screaming, wouldn't be accusing, wouldn't be threatening. If I can remember that, then I can respond in a totally different way to that behavior. That, of course, requires a great deal of inner security. And that inner security requires that I free myself from my childhood experiences which have created doubt about that security. So often, in order to heal my relationship today with whatever person that may be, I may need to heal first my childhood experiences, and especially with parents. Another aspect of having a healthy relationship is to continue growing and evolving. Now this time sometimes create problem. I must admit this to you because if you are growing and the other person is not, and the other person says, look, when we decided to get married, uh, you like these things, I still like them, you don't like them anymore, it's not my fault. You're the one that has changed. I didn't change. 
I want my money back. <laughs> He's right. What can we say? The problem is a human being cannot find complete happiness without growth. At least in, inwardly and deeply. Growth is the purpose of our existence. The relationship is one of those aspects of our lives which gives us an opportunity for growth. I think you can grow more in a relationship than you can in a monastery. In a monastery you have no one to bother you, no one to complain, no one to suppress you, no one to contradict you, unless you have the, the head of the monastery. Of course it has its own lessons and its own difficulties. But it's much more difficult to practice love with a person who makes it difficult for you to love them. In this case, I compare uh, love to gold. Gold, the gold ore, when we take it out of the earth, has many other metals in it, impurities. In order to purify the gold, so that it's only gold and no other metals, we have to heat it up and separate it. So our love is like this gold ore. There's love in there, but it's mixed with need, with fear, with attachment, with egoism. And the relationship is the fire which causes us continuously either to suffer or to get free from our attachments. Either I suffer because I'm not getting what I want from the other person, or I'm getting what I don't want, or I have to change internally and let go of some of my attachments and fears, gain greater self-confidence, self-esteem. So our love is purified in this way, whether it's the love for the child or the parent or the siblings or the spouse. So learning and growing is an important aspect. Extremely important aspect is honesty. It's a very difficult to have a healthy relationship without honesty. I know it's difficult. And I know that there are many fears around honesty. And perhaps we're not at the emotional level of evolution, which enables total honesty. It takes two quite evolved persons, two quite secure persons within themselves with a high degree of self-esteem to be always totally honest. But it is a great challenge. What we can do is to do it in increments. If we're totally honest from the first day, probably we'll, the relationship will be destroyed in about an hour. Okay? But we can incrementally increase our honesty as time goes on and learn to say the truth with as much love as possible. Another aspect is to overcome our fears. We have a lot of fears. Just as we have fears of being alone, we have as many fears of, about being totally open and close with somebody. We fear losing our freedom. We fear abandonment. We fear rejection, we fear suppression, okay? And these fears cause us to create certain barriers, whether it be with our parents or children or spouse or family in any way. These fears need to be removed, and the most effective way that I know to remove these fears is to be in the relationship and to use EFT for getting emotional freedom techniques, for getting free from those fears. It's very effective for working on that. But again, it's very possible that we will need to work with childhood experiences. This reminds me of a story that I heard in Greece. Uh, a son says to his father, Dad, I don't know what to do, to get married or not to get married. And he looks at him and he says, Son, what can I tell you? Whatever you do, you will regret it. So if you stay alone, you'll regret it. If you get married, you'll regret it. It's uh, can't be happy with, can't be happy without. Another aspect of creating a healthy relationship 
is distinguishing between the other person and their behavior. And I guess we have to distinguish between ourselves and our behavior. My personal belief system, after 35 years of spiritual searching, is that we are incarnations of divine consciousness. That we are immortal souls who temporarily take on these physical bodies. And in our essence, we are good. In our essence, we are divine. We are godlike. We are beautiful and loving and peaceful and very good beings. The problem is that being programmed in the society that we are born, we learn to fear. And that fear has caused us to cover this goodness and this love. The same is true for the other. The other is an incarnation of divine consciousness. And it's a very specific incarnation of divine consciousness, which I need to have contact with at this, pro at this point in my evolutionary process, because I have something to learn from that particular being. So what I need to do is to distinguish between their behavior, which is a function of their programmings and fears, just as my behavior is a function of my programmings and fears, and learn to love their essence, regardless of how they behave. When I make this distinction, I will be able to maintain love and a loving connection, regardless of the other person's behavior. I will, however, be able, at that time, having made that distinction, to be quite assertive about what kinds of behavior I am willing to accept and not accept. Love does not mean we allow the other person to do whatever they like. That is not love. That is usually fear. If I love someone and I actually see them as a being in a process of evolution, I am obliged to ask of them to treat me correctly. This is for the good of their evolutionary process. I do not help someone when I allow them to be controlled by their programmings. Of course, however, if I'm going to be as demanding of them as that, then I should be as demanding of myself. And what I ask of them, the respect that I demand from them, I should also demand from myself towards them. Also, as I already mentioned, to see the other as a teacher. Now, when I say see the other as a teacher, that doesn't mean that I have to do as they do. It simply means that I am learning through this person. I am learning through their positive characteristics, and I'm learning through their negative characteristics. I can learn from both. If I, as a soul, have incarnated to learn certain lessons, such as self-respect or self-esteem, or inner security, or forgiveness, or love without conditions, then it will be very natural that I will have made a soul agreement with my children and my parents and my spouse and siblings to give me the stimuli that I need in order to learn those lessons. I call these the secret soul agreements. So I may have made a secret soul agreement with persons close to me to behave towards me in a certain way so that I will be forced to find within myself certain qualities and attributes that I would never find if I did not have that test, if I did not have that teacher. It's important to try to remember this so that I can feel grateful towards that person for the lessons that they're allowing me to learn. Again, one of the lessons may be that I deserve better behavior. And one of the lessons may be that, look, I love you, I accept you, and I will respect you, but I need to be respected by you. 
Another very important aspect of creating a healthy relationship is to keep promises or don't make them. When someone asks me, are you going to do something, I'm always, I always put an if or a but or we'll see. If I'm not sure that I can do it, I won't say it, because if I say it, I have to do it. It's very important. Relationships cannot survive when repeatedly we make promises we don't keep. The other person feels repeatedly that they're not being respected, they're not being loved, and this undermines the unity of the relationship. So before I say yes and agree to something, think about it. Say, well, I'll think about it. Let's, let's decide tomorrow. And when we have given our word and we cannot keep it, let's go and say, look, I really want to ask forgiveness. I said I would do this, but it's impossible for these reasons. Or do it. So it's very important to evaluate in all of our relationships, two children, two parents. And you know, this also has to do even with punishment. When I promised my child that there is going to be consequences if he or she does or does not do something, and then I don't do that, that creates insecurity. That's as bad as saying I'm going to take you and get some ice cream and not giving it to them. Because what we're learning is the human word doesn't mean anything. And that creates a great deal of insecurity in relationships. It's something that we have lost in modern society. There was a day when there were no written contracts. A man's word was his word. You didn't need to write anything down. Now you can write whatever you want and it still doesn't mean anything. So this is a very this is lacking in our society. So it's very important in all of our close relationships and also it would be wonderful in our business relationships to keep our word. The next aspect which I have written here is unconditional, no, is a, to be able to be happy and secure alone. I already mentioned that. It's important to be able to be happy by ourselves and then to choose to be with the others. Unconditional love. Now that's a big word. And none of us can have unconditional love until we are enlightened. Until then, our love is going to be conditional. And the conditions, the, the most we can hope for is to lessen those conditions, to remove one condition after the other as it is presented to us by our children, by our parents, by our siblings, and by our love partners. So we will have these conditions. They won't fill them. So what do I do? Do I start hating them? Or do I remove the condition? Our choice. The thing is that it's in our advantage to remove the condition because we're happier. But then we say, what, the other guy's going to do whatever he wants and I'm going to love him? Why not? I'm happier if I can. Those negative feelings are causing my illness, not his. They're disturbing my nervous system, my endocrine system, my energy system is being disturbed by my anger and my hurt and my resentment. They are poisoning me, not him. Again, it doesn't mean that I can't say to the other person and be effective in asking what I want. So. I would suggest that we all look at the conditions that we put on our love today. And again, not to be repetitive, but I am repetitive. EFT is the most effective way for removing the conditions. Is see the condition and employ the technique on removing the fear which prevents me from loving this person even though this person is acting in this way. It's a wonderful opportunity. And the wonderful thing is that life is a mirror. And the moment I am able to continue to have positive, loving feelings towards that person, it's very highly likely that they will change. Much more likely than if I continue criticizing them and rejecting them. Many times their behavior is only there because I, as a soul, have made that secret agreement with them 
to behave to me in that way so that I can get free from that attachment that I have and learn to love even in that situation. And then when I'm able to do that, their behavior changes. I have seen it over and over and over again. Something else which will happen very, which will help very much is our own connection to the divine. Depending on your own religion and your own beliefs, a connection with a higher power, with a higher entity, whatever you may call that power, with which I can have a, a, a live relationship. When I mean a live relationship, I mean I talk to that being daily. I communicate my feelings to that being daily. Not just through typical prayers and written prayers, but a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with my best friend, with my teacher, with my doctor, with my God, with my psychologist, with that being with which I can have a relationship, whatever may happen. If others are there, if they're not there, if I'm free, if I'm in prison, if I'm dying, if I'm alive, this one universal being toward whom I have access at every moment, wherever I may be. By creating this relationship, we can have a greater sense of inner security and inner fulfillment which will make us less needy in our relationships, less demanding, less vulnerable, more relaxed, because we can give more because we have our own source of, of fulfillment and happiness and love. Doesn't mean we don't ask from the other person. We still ask. But because we have this other relationship, we are much more fulfilled and much less dependent. Another aspect is to learn to love and accept ourselves. All of our relationships, including our relationships with all of our loved ones, and even our relationship with God, is actually a reflection of our relationship with ourselves. I have seen this over and over again. If we don't love ourselves, if we don't accept ourselves, it's very difficult to love and accept others, and it's very difficult to have their love and acceptance. This is called sympathetic resonance, or sympathetic vibration. People are resonating to me, or vibrating to me, my own relationship with myself. I criticize myself, they criticize me. I reject myself, they reject me. I don't respect myself, they don't respect me. So this is a very important aspect of creating healthy relationships, to create a healthy relationship with myself. And this, of course, will require freeing ourselves from all of our childhood programming about our self-worth. Because as I have mentioned in just about every lecture, as children, we learn to doubt our self-worth and our ability. And although as adults we know differently, our inner child, our subconscious still doubts. And that inner child is responsible for 90 plus percent of all of our emotions. Our emotions are not based on our logic. They are based on our subconscious programming. Another aspect which is very important is not to speak about our relationships with our loved ones to other people unless that person is a psychologist or a minister or a priest or a sheikh or someone who will sit there and try to help us with that. Just gossiping and complaining about our loved one's behavior is just increasing the negativity in the universe around that person and around ourselves. And whether you will say, well, they don't hear this, subconsciously they hear it. And subconsciously their attitude towards us is a function of that. 
So it's very a good rule to apply is never to say anything about anyone that we would not say if they were not sitting there. Now, it's totally different to go to a person who is professional, who wants to help us see what we can do, and to share with them the problem and try to get help about that. But to sit there smoking cigarettes and drinking our coffee and burying the other person under a, a pile of complaints and accusations has no value whatsoever. It's better to refrain from such behavior. Another aspect that I'd like to focus on is the expression of love and admiration. One thing that you will be asked to do on Saturday is to make a list, to choose one person you want to work with, and to make a list of all of their past positive attributes. What happens is that when we are hurt by someone's behavior, we need to close our hearts, because if we don't close them, we are more vulnerable and we get hurt. And rather than being hurt over and over again, we create this shield. And the shield is not to feel the other person. But in order to be able to do this, because this is unnatural for divine souls, this is an unnatural state for the heart to be closed, I have to find reasons to close it. So I have to accumulate in my mind all the negative aspects of the other person and not recognize any positive ones. When people ask people, look, write down all the positive things that you can think of about your husband. He doesn't have any. Just think. Is he a hard worker? Oh yeah, but yeah, that doesn't matter. Is he honest? Oh yeah, but you see, if I ask someone else who knows this person, he's a great guy, he's funny, he's honest, he's you know, good to be with. I have allowed my feelings to close my heart to being able to see the other person's positive qualities. So it's very important when we have negative feelings towards someone to remember those qualities and once in a while to tell them. You know, I admire this in you. I don't like this in you, but I like this and this and this. You're a great person. Because often people's behavior, most of the time people's behavior, is a function of the fact that they have self-doubt. And when we can affirm them on a regular basis, often they don't need to move into negativity modes in order to get the attention that they need. When we give positive attention, they don't need the negative attention. And one last thing that I would like to say, all of these we'll be working on in detail on Saturday. Uh, it is very important is that to visualize our loved ones daily in light and to wish them to be well. And especially those with whom we have difficulties. This will help to melt and dissolve the negativity within us and this positive energy that we'll be sending out to them will be helping them get rid of their negativity and feel more positive towards us. And this can be used even in professional situations and work situations. I have a number of people that have come to me who have had bad relationships with co-workers in the same office and I, just, I suggest to them, look, every morning pray for them for one minute, three minutes. Visualize them in light, with the light around them and in them, and pray for them to be happy and healthy and well. And immediately, they see a difference in that person's behavior. Immediately. So it's very important, especially where there is negativity, for us to do this positive visualization and or prayer. Okay, so those are some basic ideas about what we can do to create healthy and harmonious relationships. We'll be working on those in much more detail on Saturday.